hello guys welcome back so in this video i'll be explaining and solving some questions that came out in the just concluded utme 2024 mock all right so let's get started all right so this is the first question that we have four metal liberates h2 from hno3 so this is an aspect of chemistry that is called the descriptive chemistry all right so now i'm going to take us back to the um laboratory preparation of hydrogen now we have several methods of laboratory preparation of hydrogen but i'm going to pick just one that relates to this question and explain so the laboratory preparation of hydrogen that relates to this question is the displacement of hydrogen from an acid by a metal so we have this the displacement of hydrogen from an acid by using moderately acid metals e.g calcium magnesium and zinc the most common acids that are being used in this reaction are dilute HCl and dilute H2SO4 so these are the two acids that are commonly used for this reaction so this is the reaction equation so this is the this is the, this is the production of um, the production of hydrogen by the displacement from an acid by moderately active metals all right now a very important thing to know about this 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 process is that HNO3 is not used for this reaction. Now, why is HNO3 not used for this reaction? It's because HNO3 is a very, very strong oxidizing agent, all right? Now, what is an oxidizing agent? An oxidizing agent is an agent that causes the oxidation of another species while itself gets reduced, all right? Now, what is oxidation in terms of hydrogen? Oxidation is the loss of hydrogen while reduction is the gain of hydrogen. So now, HNO3 is going to cause another thing to lose hydrogen. That is, it's going to add hydrogen to itself. You know, reduction is, the, reduction is the addition of hydrogen, right? And then I told you that oxidizing agents get reduced, Abby. So it means that hydrogen is going to be added to that species that is acting as the oxidizing agent instead of, it lo in instead of the species losing hydrogen, all right? So that's why HNO3 is not used for this reaction. Because instead of HNO3 to lose hydrogen, it will actually prefer to gain hydrogen. Do you understand that? So that is why HNO3 is really not used for this reaction. But then there is an exception, all right? In chemistry, there is exception to practically everything. So there is an exception to that principle. Even though HNO3 is not used for this reaction, there are some metals, although well, not some, just two metals, that can actually remove hydrogen from HNO3. Only magnesium and manganese can remove hydrogen from very dilute HNO3. Very, very important, all right? So now, it is only magnesium and manganese that can actually remove hydrogen from very dilute HNO3. So the answer is magnesium and manganese. Thank you. All right, so this is another question. When water is freezed, what happens to its density? Now, you should know that water and any other liquid, they don't actually follow the same pattern when you are eating and when you are cooling it. All right, now there is something that is called the anomalous expansion of water. Now, what is anomalous expansion of water? Now, basically, water shows anomaly in its expansion and in its contraction from 0 degrees Celsius to 4 degrees Celsius. So, water shows anomalous expansion from 0 degrees Celsius to 4 degrees Celsius. That is, this, this concept, this, this, what I wrote, is a question on its own. Now, what is anomalous expansion? Now, when you are eating a liquid, normally, when you are eating a liquid, the liquid is supposed to be expanding, right? That's it, its volume is supposed to be increasing while its density is decreasing. That is, when you are increasing the temperature of a liquid, the volume is going to be increasing since it's expanding while its density will be decreasing. Density and volume are inversely proportional. So, the, when density is increasing, the volume is decreasing and vice versa. So, now, when you are eating a liquid, as I was saying, the volume is supposed to be increasing while its density is decreasing, right? So that is the normal way that it's supposed to go. But then when you are eating water, from zero degrees Celsius to four degrees Celsius, water contracts. Then from four degrees Celsius upwards, then water starts its own expansion. That is, when you eat water, water contracts first, then expands. Do you get? And of course, when you are, when you are cooling the temperature, that is when you, are, when you are freezing, from 100 degrees Celsius to four, to four degrees Celsius, water contracts. Then from 4 degrees Celsius to 0 degrees Celsius, water expands. So this is what we have. From 0 degrees Celsius to 4 degrees Celsius, water contracts first. Then from 4 degrees Celsius to 100 degrees Celsius, water expands. Alright? So I trust we understand this. 
This is the reverse. So from 100 degrees Celsius to 4 degrees Celsius, water contracts. Then from 4 degrees Celsius to 0 degrees Celsius, water expands. So now, let us relate this expansion and contraction to the volume and to the density. So when something is contracting, definitely the volume is what? The volume is decreasing. And when something is expanding, the volume is increasing. Do we understand? So now, 0 degrees, to, 0 degrees Celsius to 4 degrees Celsius, water contracts. So it means the volume is decreasing. Okay, so this is what we have. Now, from 0 degrees Celsius to 4 degrees Celsius, water is contracting. The volume is decreasing. So the volume decreases first. Then 4 degrees Celsius to 100 degrees Celsius, where water expands, the volume increases. So it means water decreases in volume first, then increases at long run. Now, when you are contracting, the volume decreases first, that is, it contracts. Then at the, at the long run, it increases. When it gets to 4 degrees Celsius to 0 degrees Celsius, water expands, the volume increases. So as I said, the volume, volume and density, they are inversely proportional. So anywhere volume is decreasing, the density is increasing. And anywhere the volume is, is increasing, the density is decreasing. This is what we have. So I think we have our answer now, right? So what does the question say? When water is freezed, what happens to its density? From 100 degrees Celsius to 4 degrees Celsius, what happens first? Water contracts. That's it. Its volume is decreasing. Density increases first. Then from 4 degrees Celsius to 0 degrees Celsius, which is at the last part of the, of the process, water is going to expand such that the volume will increase and the density will decrease. So this is the correct answer. So this is the correct answer. The density decreases. So I hope you understand this third question. Name the organic compound below. Now to make everything easier for us, let us expand this first. So alright, this is what we have. Now there's a mistake in this question. Yeah, this hydrogen that they added is not supposed to be there. If you add another hydrogen here, carbon is going to be carrying five bonds and that is very very wrong. Alright, the maximum amount of bonds that you can have around carbon is four. So now this is the correct way. Alright, so now how do we name this compound? Now, the first rule of naming an organic compound, all right, is to count the longest continuous carbon chain. So the longest continuous carbon chain that we can count here is one, two, three, four, basically. Now, there is another chain, one, two, three, four. It is also correct. One, two, three, four is correct. One, two, three, four is also correct. And those are the two longest chains that we can have. So we can, we can pick any of the two. They will still give us the same thing. Now this is what we have, alright? 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4. Now you can number your carbon either ways. You can either, you can, you can choose to number it like this, you can choose to number it like this. But then mind you, not the two numberings will be correct at the long run. Now this is what we have. If you want to name this, this is a 4 carbon chain. So definitely it's going to be what? A boot, right? So the pair name is going to be a boot. Now, I wrote two boots here. Like this. That is the first one for this first numbering that we have. The second one for this second numbering that we have, alright? So now, we have boots. We have a double bond on this carbon. That is between these two carbons. We have a double bond. So if you are numbering it, if you are using this numbering, it is going to be what? Boot 2. Right? Because the carbon carrying double bond is the second carbon in this case. Alright? So it's going to be a boot 2. So it's going to be a boot 2 in. Alright? So we have this. So boot 2 in. Now, if you are numbering this other way, what do we have? We have 1, 2. Now the double bond is still on the second carbon relative to this numbering. So we have boot 2 in. Now there is a substituent in this guy. Now what's the substituent? The substituent is this methyl group, which is CH3. Now this CH3 is on this carbon. Now relative to the first number that we have up here, it is on carbon 3. And relative to the second number that we have down here, it is on carbon 2. So we can either have 3 methyl boots 2 in relative to the first number and what 2 methyl boots 2 in relative to the second number. So which one is the correct one here? Now, there is a rule in naming organic compound. It is called the lowest locant rule. Now, what's the lowest locant rule? The lowest locant rule is telling you that once you have your parent functional group to be constant, that is, you have your parent name to be constant, this is the parent, and these two are the substituents. Now, the rule is telling you that if your parent name is constant, your substituents must carry the lowest locant. Now, what is the locant? A locant is a number that is used to show the position of a substituent. This 2 methyl is telling that there is a methyl on the second carbon, and this 3 methyl is telling that there is a methyl on the third carbon. So, these 3 or these 2, they are called locants. Alright? So, now we have this. Now, the lowest locant rule tells you that what? Your substituents must carry the lowest locant. Of course, between 2 and 3, which one is the smallest? 2 definitely is the smallest, so this is correct, while wow, this is wrong. So, the 2 methyl boots 2 in is the correct answer, while wow, the 3 methyl boots 2 in 
is wrong. All right. We have this question. Another solution X when exposed to air turns blue. What is this? And I don't, what is this solution X? Now, this concept basically we need to we need to understand two different concepts in chemistry. The first one is the nature of salt, and the second one is the test for water. So we have this, we have efflorescence, deliquescence, and hygroscopy. These are the three characteristics of the nature of salt that we have. Now, what is efflorescence? Efflorescence basically has to do with when an hydrated salt is exposed to the atmosphere, then this hydrated salt now loses water of crystallization to become anhydrous. Hydrated basically is something that has water. Anhydrous is a dry stuff, that is something that doesn't have water. So now, efflorescence, when hydrated salts are exposed to the atmosphere, then these hydrated salts, they now lose their water of crystallization to become what? To become anhydrous. So that is it. So this is what we have. An example of an efflorescence of. Now the second one, deliquescence. Now deliquescence basically has to do with when anhydrous salts are exposed to the atmosphere. Now these anhydrous salts, they now absorb water to become a solution. So basically, that is what deliquescence is. Now the third one, hygroscopy. Hygroscopy is the phenomenon whereby when anhydrous salts are exposed to the atmosphere, these guys, they also absorb water of, of crystallization. But then these guys, they absorb water of crystallization, but they do not turn into solution. They absorb water of crystallization and they become wet. They become wet or they become sticky, basically. So a very good example of that is quicklime, CO. CO is an hygroscopic salt. So, so that is the first concept that we need to know. So now the second concept that I was talking about, the test for water. So this is the test for water. So water turns white anhydrous CuSO4 to blue hydrated form. While water also turns blue anhydrous cobalt 2 chloride. This is COCl2 to pink hydrated. So now let's go back to the question. I think we have an answer already, right? So anhydrous solution X, when exposed to air, it turns blue. What is this anhydrous solution? So first of all, when it was exposed to air, if we merge the two things I've said together, the, the characteristics of salt and the test for water. If we match it together, we can easily deduce that the compound that I'm talking about is CuSO4, right? Now, how do we get CuSO4? So, we said the liquid compounds, when they, when they absorb water from the atmosphere, they do what? They turn into solution. Now, water, test for water is also telling you that if you add water to an hydrous form of CuSO4, it turns to the blue hydrated form. And the question I told you that was an hydrous solution, when it's supposed to air, it turns blue. So I think we have our answer, right? The correct answer is CuSO4. That is copper 2 tetraoxysulfate 6. That is the correct answer. So this is the fifth question. So the question says, what indicator is used in the titration of KOH against the Danaic acid? So this concept is testing our knowledge of indicators. Now, in titration, we use two major indicators. The two major indicators that are used in titration are methyl orange and phenolphthalein. So these are the two major indicators that are used in titration. So now, when we are titrating a strong acid versus a strong base, we can use any suitable indicator that we, that, that, that we like. We can either use methyl orange, we can use phenolphthalein. So now, when we are testing a strong acid versus a, a weak base, we use methyl orange as the indicator in the titration of a strong acid and a weak base. Now, when we are titrating a weak acid plus a strong base, we use phenolphthalein. When we have a weak acid and a weak base, there is no indicator that can be used for that kind of titration. So we have this, strong acid, strong base, any suitable indicator, strong acid, weak base, methyl orange, weak acid, strong base, phenolphthalein, weak acid, weak base, no suitable indicator. So that is what we have. So now let us go back to the question. The question says, what indicator is used in the titration of KOH against ethanoic acid? KOH is a strong base, while ethanoic acid is a weak acid, alright? So now, we have a strong base titration versus a weak acid. So what do we have? Let us check our table. A strong base versus a weak acid. What do we have? Phenolphthalein is the correct answer. Phenolphthalein. So that is our correct answer. Phenolphthalein. So this is what we have. So I hope you enjoyed this video. So please do well to like and subscribe and turn on notification for my new videos. So thank you very much and have a wonderful day.